May 20th, 2022, the Twitter account at KozatskyD posted the following message. Well, that's all. Thank you from the shelters of Azovstal, the place of my death and my life. It was followed by a link to a set of 25 pictures taken at one of the epicenters of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. These pictures were unlike anything that had been seen before, showing the final days under siege of a Ukrainian battalion before they were captured. While foreign photojournalists have flocked to Ukraine to document the conflict, many of them focused on the civilian response. For some of these photographers, their assignment ended months ago, returning to the safety of their home countries. It's quite different when it's your own homeland under attack, and when you're not a member of the foreign press, but an active combatant on the front lines. This is the case with Dmitry Kozatsky, and this is the story of the images he took before he was captured. This story, like much of Ukraine's resurgent nationalist sentiment, traces its origins eight years ago to the Maidan Revolution. At the time, a young Kozatsky had left his hometown of Malin to study in Poland. However, he soon felt the pull of his homeland as historic protests were spreading through nearby Kiev. Kozatsky put his studies on hold and moved to Ukraine's capital, volunteering his time to support the protesters entrenched in the Maidan. A year later, he signed up with the Ukrainian National Guard and ended up joining the Azov Battalion, stationed in Mariupol. From a young age, Kozatsky was interested in photography and had aspirations to study journalism. However, it was when he joined the battalion that he was able to put this into practice, rising to become the head of its press service. In the early months of the Russian invasion, he fielded interviews with news organizations and took photos and videos for social media. The headquarters of the Azov Battalion were located in Mariupol, a strategic port city coveted by Russian forces from the early days of the invasion. From February to May of 2022, Russian forces laid siege to Mariupol, shelling the city into oblivion. The Azov Battalion was forced to retreat, along with thousands of civilians, into an abandoned steel mill, the infamous Azovstal. This industrial plant was transformed into a fortified bunker, a maze of tunnels where the battalion would make their last stand. And this is where Kozatsky's photos begin. Fortunately, Kozatsky left the EXIF metadata on his photos intact, so we can reconstruct the sequence of events. We can see at what time and date the pictures were taken, what equipment he used, and what settings he used for each shot. Kozatsky used a small mirrorless camera with a fixed 30mm prime lens. This can be a bit tight in confined spaces, but he also used an iPhone for wider shots. We can correlate these internal pictures with the external events of the siege of Azovstal. May 7th, the last remaining civilians are evacuated from Azovstal. This is where Kozatsky's photos begin, showing soldiers in their downtime. Most of them seem to be taken candidly, with a few glances here and there towards the camera. On this day he took what would become his most famous photograph, which would later be called Light Will Win. Kozatsky had come across this ray of light before, while walking between bunkers at Azovstal, and he immediately recognized its potential. He had taken a few test shots with his phone the day before, but on May 7th, he was able to bring his camera along. With no tripod, Kozatsky rested his camera on an old barrel. He set a timer and then got into position. This photo would travel around the world, becoming a symbol of hope and resilience for Ukrainians at home and abroad. But on May 7th, it was just another file on Dmitry Kozatsky's camera. May 8th, the remaining Ukrainian fighters vowed to hold out, despite the completed civilian evacuation. Commanders of the Azov Battalion hold a press conference via Zoom, lamenting their dire situation 
but reiterating the commitment to stay and fight. May 10th, Kozatsky takes more photos with more emphasis on the casualties of war. While these pictures may not be as pleasing to look at, they are just as important. In a recent interview, the president of the Ukrainian Association of Professional Photographers, Mstislav Chernov, stated that it's quite important to make war coverage as raw as possible, so people don't see the war as something beautiful, so viewers don't think war is only smoke rising over the city or crying children, that the war is actually so brutal, it's blood and gore and suffering and blown off limbs, mass graves. All those things need to be shown as bluntly as possible. Most of Kazatsky's photos were taken in short windows of time, and there's a lot that went on behind the scenes unphotographed. However, we can learn about these gaps in time through his mother, Irina, whom he had kept in touch with since the invasion began. While Kazatsky was in Mariupol, his sister was in a bunker in Kiev, and his mother worked as a train conductor, helping to evacuate civilians from other parts of the country. In interviews, Kozatsky's mother mentioned that he was very anxious about photographing the wounded at Azovstal, and it was one of the most terrifying experiences of his life. She also shared some of the dangers of the plant. One night, Kozatsky was almost killed by a wall collapsing on his bed. As the situation at Azovstal worsened, the frequency of contact was reduced, from video calls to phone calls to text messages only. May 11th, Kozatsky uploads an interview with Valeria Karpilenko, one of his fellow recruits. The interview describes the tragic story of her husband Andre, another Azov fighter. After dating for three years, they were just married in Azov style on May 5th. He died defending the steel mill just two days later. May 16th, wounded Ukrainian forces are evacuated in order to negotiate a prisoner swap. Orders from Kyiv are declaring the combat mission in Mariupol over and to stop defending the mill in order to save the lives of the remaining fighters. We have a hope that we will protect the lives of our soldiers. Among them there are difficult wounds. It is needed help. Ukrainian heroes need to be Ukrainian alive. This is our principle. I think that these words are understood by everyone an adequate person. Azov's style is becoming emptier. Kozatsky takes a picture among the ruins. May 19th. It's been raining for the past two days, and during this time, Kozatsky records some footage of the almost empty steel mill. This will be his last day at Azov's style. On this day, he takes one final photograph. May 20th, Russian forces take control of the steel plant. Kozatsky posts all of his photos on Twitter and they go around the world. The captured fighters were moved to Russian detention centers and for a while their fate remained unknown. Ukrainian authorities called for a prisoner exchange while Russian authorities talked of putting them on trial. Videos were circulated by the press showing the fighters' living conditions under captivity. On July 28th, a short video surfaced of a captured Kozatsky, clean-shaven, being questioned by an off-camera person about his involvement in Azov. On August 2nd, Russia's Supreme Court declared the Azov Regiment a terrorist organization due to its controversial far-right origins origins from which the current iteration of the battalion has tried to distance itself. For Russian authorities, this meant that terror charges could be levied against the captured fighters, resulting in harsher sentences. If an American athlete can get sentenced to nine years in a labor camp for possession of cannabis oil, the consequences for the captured Azov-style fighters seemed grim. On August 6th, images were circulated alleging that makeshift prison cells were being built at the Mariupol Philharmonic to put the captured soldiers on trial. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky warned that such a trial would destroy any chance of negotiation between the two countries. 
In the meantime, Grzadzki's photographs were circulating around the world, winning several international awards. But would Grzadzki ever be able to accept these awards? For months, the fate of the Azov-style defenders remained in limbo. And that's where I thought the story would end. But then, on September 21st, everything changed. Stefania, mamo, mamo, Stefania, rozkwitaje pole, a wona syvije. Zaspiwaj meni, mamo, kolesko, chociuż się poczuty 